You're listening to Head South Radio with your host, Kat Meyer, a podcast dedicated to prioritizing pleasure and removing the stigma and shame around sex. We're here to be curious and have an open conversation about sexual health and relational wellness. This podcast is intended for educational and entertainment purposes. The information discussed is not a substitute for professional medical advice. Just closing your eyes and dropping into your seat. So feeling the weight of gravity. Start to feel a rootedness within your sit bones, grounding down south. And then from that rooted feeling, can we all grow a little bit taller through the crown of the head, reaching the top of our head up towards the ceiling. And then start to let your shoulder blades drop down your back. The tops of the shoulders dangle away from your ears, feeling a lengthening in your neck, finding some integrity with your spine. And then just taking a moment for yourself to set an intention for the next hour of conversation. And then whenever you're ready, just start to blink your eyes open, taking in your room, taking in the light, taking in the space, taking in your screen. What a kind way to say sit up, (laughs) back straight. I love that. Yeah. What? Can we have that in class? I'm doing that in class. That's awesome. I'm doing that Absolutely. For it's such a nice way to start any type of group work is to kind of all ground yourselves and really get into a certain intention like setting. It. Yeah, it's really, I really, really enjoy starting the conversation that way. I love it. I can it. start a lot of stuff that way. Yeah, Meetings it's really nice. Mm-hmm. Conferences, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I actually do have started talks that way. I am a yoga teacher as well. And so it's oh, just a really immediately nice tell. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's just a nice way to bring a group or a collective of people together and kind of, Very good. you know, tune into our breath, tune into our bodies. And then we're going to jump into some icebreakers. So, <laughs> oh. really? Yeah. So I'm going to ask Dorico first Are you the dominant or more submissive one in your relationship? I am the dominant one. Did you see his shirt? I know I can't. It's cut off. <laughs> Maestro Daddy, Master, Mr. King, Sir, Dom. Nice. Do you make your own shirts? Because every time I see you, you have a different, you make the shirt, you design the shirt. I that. <laughs> yep. Do you guys sell the shirts? Because you have great shirts. Every time we, I see you. We do, but they're, okay. they're typically like on our website for our school for students yeah. to access, but we haven't posted them like publicly. Yeah. Very cool. I think we need to start. Yeah, I think you should. (laughs) Um, E. Michelle, would you rather have sex to the same song every day or never have sex with music on? Never have sex with music on. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to tell you why, because... Yeah. Well, I do have a favorite song right now that... that (laughs) I do have a favorite song right now that we tend to um, choose, but I also like to sing. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. then I find myself singing the song in the midst of intimacy. So we don't go with no music. (laughs) You're damned if there's a Taylor Swift song in my head when I'm singing. I say up too late. Uh, Oh, no. My bad. No. My bad. (laughs) Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Okay. No, I'm I'm a believer in that. I like I do like making a playlist to set mm-hmm. the mood, but it's often I can't choose songs that I love that I want to sing along to. Those are for like in the car, right. in the shower, by myself. <laughs> right. It, music has to be kind of like moody, but I don't ha- I don't want to know the lyrics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's my problem because I want to sing along. <laughs> it's like this is not the time to be singing along. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this one's for both of you. Would you rather be terrible in bed or terrible kissers? Which one you going? I I, I, te- I would rather be a terrible kisser. Yep, terrible kisser. Mm-hmm. There's room for improvement in, in everything, but I would rather be a terrible kisser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then again, for both of you, what do you prefer? Morning sex, evening sex, afternoon sex? sex? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
I would say right now I prefer evening. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of our time doing what we like to call F breaks as parents, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) When the kids were like at school or whatever, and we just wanted to take time and intimacy, but now we're having more opportunity to kind of just be more spontaneous because Mm -hmm. we're almost empty nesters. All of our kids are grown and they're at college Mm -hmm. when they're not away. So I think we, in the evening, after we've done all the work, we're spending more time being intentional around intimacy. Mm -hmm. That then gets us to more pleasure in our sexual intimacy space. What do you think, Dorico? The fact that we have the ability to, at this age right now, to be able to spend time with each other so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm sex all the time. Whenever we can get it, whenever it's, whenever we're in that space. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm at the, you know, we're like, like she said, our kids are grown. So they know now, Mm -hmm. (laughs) they know more now than ever to knock and (laughs) to not bother me. Once I go to bed and it's after eight, you don't want to come up to that door. Yeah. I would love to come back into that conversation because I think we, having the advice for people who are transitioning into empty nesters and reconnecting mm-hmm. intimately. So I would lo- I definitely want to make a note of like, that's a subject I'd like to touch on because it hasn't come up in my podcast interviews before. Uh-huh. And I think a lot of people, you know, I've talked to people postpartum and how to like reconnect with your partner. But I think there is that like the transition of your children going into adulthood and then reconnecting. And a lot of people kind of experience like, wait, who, who have I been sharing a bed with this whole time? Like right. a lot mm-hmm. of that kind of comes to, comes to light. Right. So I definitely want to make note of bringing that back up. But I would love for you both to introduce yourselves and kind of talk a little bit about your backgrounds, what you do. I mean, if you don't know by now, the two of you are a couple. So our listeners who are listening, you guys are a couple. And so I would love for you to share the work that you do and how you do it and who you work with. So I guess I'll, I'll go first. Mm-hmm. I am sexology C. Michelle. I'm an American Board of Sexology. An American College of Sexologists certified sexologist. I like to tell people I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. I've technically been doing all things sex since about 2008. Intimacy. I'm a in- certified intimacy and relationship coach, a somatic body practitioner. Like there's so many things. Embodiment practitioner. There's so many things that I do, but I'm all things pleasure, right? My goal is to get people to have pleasure in perpetuity. I want them to have it for the rest of their lives. And I work largely with women and couples, like desire discrepancies on sex exploration. So them trying to expand the level of sex that they're having. And that includes all the things, kink, BDSM, you know, embodiment, sexual practices, variety, all of those things. So, yeah. Oh, and I am also the founder and the director of the Pleasure Masters Institute, which is an institute dedicated to training other sexuality professionals to be sex coaches certified sexologist and certified intimacy and relationship coach. Amazing. Yeah. Don't Lots forget that people. last part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget that last part. <laughs> I'm Dorico Thomas. I am a uh, veteran of the United States Navy, um, disabled vet. I'm an ABS certified sexologist, uh, filmmaker, actor, writer, sometimes musician, as long as everyone else's ears are closed. And um, a uh, chocolate chip cookie connoisseur. So uh, if you have oh. chocolate chip cookies and you are close to me, you will not have them if you look away. So I am the cookie <laughs> monster in our house. <laughs> Most recently, I have uh, been given the name of the pleasure pastor. Mm. I tend to guide people to pleasure the way uh, Christians guide people to, to Jesus. And I'm all about guiding people through pleasure as much mm-hmm. as possible. So my altar is a different type of altar. It's, it's all pussy. All the time. <laughs> that's that's my altar. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm caring about. I'm here for men, um, but I want men to understand that there is a great deal of uh, masculinity that's involved in recognizing the power of a woman. So I'm mm-hmm. trying to go ahead and get them there. That's what I'm here for. I'm also one of the sexologists here at the PMI Institute, and I'm currently teaching a class, and I will be teaching another class, I guess, closer to the end of the year. But uh, right now, it's it's a really great experience, and this is what I love to do. So can I ask, E. Michelle, were you starting in this career? And Rico, did you kind of follow suit, like saw what your wife partner was doing? And then, Absolutely. and were you guys, obviously you were married before this? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes. I tell people, and 
I share this story with my husband's consent Mm -hmm. that my husband was active duty Navy. He got really sick. My husband got something called disseminated valley fever, which is kind of like the worst form of valley fever. And valley fever is endemic to the central San Joaquin Valley where we were living on base. Um, His captain came to me and said, get your affairs in order. Your husband is not going to live long. And that was me as someone who was a stay-at-home mom supporting his military career with four children. And it was a shock of my life. Like, how in the world am I going to support these children? When I, my husband's been the primary breadwinner. I was in college at that time. What am I going to do? And I knew so much about intimacy. The path just led me into, I created the very first plus size pole dance franchise company in the world. And that is, it it, it propelled me into all things, pleasure and sex and sensuality. And then once my husband got better, he was in support of all of the things that I was doing and he wanted to learn more. He wanted to be the pathway to helping the men. And so now that's what we do 24 seven. Thank you for sharing that story. Thank you. So how do you both define intimacy? Oh. That's a really good question. Dorico, you want to go first? Yes. I'm going to say that for me as a man, intimacy is the, is empathetic vulnerability. It's being able to recognize my own vulnerabilities and being safe enough to have someone add value to that vulnerability. That's to me, that's intimacy. It is, I will share, I genuinely feel like there's so many facets to intimacy, right? We, when most people talk about it, they're immediately thinking about sex. And for me, it's my emotional connectedness with my husband, right? It's my spiritual connectedness with him. It's my ability to be vulnerable and be transparent. It's my opportunity to sit to sit in the spaces with him in total silence, but still be totally connected. To just enjoy each other without all of the pretenses, without all of the the things society has to tell you. It's just connection, right? Totally pure connection with that person. And the fact that you can get a vessel to sexual intimacy is huge, but having all of those other things, I think just heightens what you get to experience when you get to have sex. I will share. I share with full transparency just in an intimate moment with my husband last night. It was so, it was just so much. The energy was so much. I started to cry afterward. And he was like, wait a minute, did I do anything? (laughs) And I'm like, no, this was the level of the safety I had in that moment was everything. And it is exactly what I needed. That I think is what intimacy is. Ooh, I have so many goosebumps right now listening to both of you. And it's so beautiful. And I really appreciate your vulnerability and transparency and sharing so explicitly. Like it's, it's incredible to hear. Um, I, and I think a lot of people don't pause to think about what their definition of intimacy is, or to your Mm -hmm. point, it's like, it leads just straight to the physical act of sex, which is right. one very small component. And like we're lucky enough to get there within that realm of having all of those other things aligned. It's right. such a beautiful then experience. And I, I would love to, um, if you can expand on that, because I think a lot of people do experience crying or um, emoting during after sex and are unaware of what to do. And if either of you have advice for when this happens to you, as well as a partner and how, how do you, how does one respond or relate or hold space for the person mm-hmm. that's experiencing that? Yeah. Uh, I think the first, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, baby. Okay. I think the first thing to do in that moment, which is what I did last night was to decenter myself. Um, that was my first instance was like, Oh wait, did I do something wrong? But then I was like, wait a minute, this is a space that she's in and she's telling me that she's okay. So now I'm going to sit in that space with her, even though I don't know what it looks like from what she, the scope of her lens, I'm going to sit here with her and just be and exist, which is a very difficult thing for men to do, to just exist. Men feel like they have to do, and they're very, they're not very well versed in just existing in a space. 
but women are very good at existing in the space with, with anyone just because, hey, I'm just here. We don't have to do shit. I'm just here. And I think that's probably the most important thing. Decenter yourself and just learn the value of just existing for someone you love. Because sometimes that's a lot of times that's enough. Yeah. Creating like I'm listening to that and it's like creating this safe container, right? For mm-hmm. for that to happen, right? Not to freak out, not to make things uh, catastrophize them, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. Getting to the place where it's a safe enough container so that people feel safe enough to to expound or not, right? Based on their level. I think for me as a person who was having the emotion, if I was giving the advice to someone, it would be really tapping into where it's coming from. That means you have to have a knowledge of all of the emotions, your emotional intelligence. You know, has you have to be able to see this isn't maybe I experienced these things, maybe these were negative, but this is where I am in this moment. And being able to identify that and being safe enough to address that with your person. Mm-hmm. is what is going to be the difference between like globalizing it and catastrophizing it as opposed to like getting down to this is something that occurred. Let's talk about this, right? It's almost aftercare. Yeah. Just yeah. allowing allowing it to exist and be. And Absolutely. That, and it is like men are more prone to doing and fixing. And, you know, our society trains men to do that and mm-hmm. to kind of hold back and just be present is not it's not conditioned. <laughs> right. But it's, it's the thing that probably needs like just, just being, being with our feelings, even on separately as humans, just sitting with our own feelings. It's really hard. And so do, do you guys do a lot of work with your clientele? And I also just really quickly wanted to clarify that we are speaking within genders or people who are assigned male and female at birth, but a lot of this information, intimacy is, is regardless of gender, orientation, dynamic, Absolutely. Even age, yeah. it, these, all of this information, although you guys pr- primarily work with certain genders, mm-hmm. it, it does apply to any type of relationship, intimate relationship dynamic, I believe. Right. Mm-hmm. And partnership, especially one that is sexual in nature. Yeah. And so I just wanted to kind of clarify that for people listening, like we, we might be using j- certain gender to speak to or certain dynamics to speak to, but it, it, this information d- absolutely applies to everyone. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. I'm glad that you said that because sexual object choice, who you decide to have sex with, is not going to be the difference in how you view intimacy. Intimacy is intimacy, right? And that happens with every single person, regardless of what your sexual object choice is, your gender, all of those things. So Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you said that, Kat. And yeah, and you know, while we as a society have certain gender roles, and that's one of the questions I wanted to ask, like societal norms and expectations around gender, and you guys are working to kind of somewhat break or introduce other other parts of our being regardless of gender what is the work that you're doing and how do you navigate those influences so how do you do you for you like with when you're working with men how do you allow them to welcome vulnerability and welcome the idea of just being and sitting with and then for you e michelle like how do you kind of allow women to work through being more um demanding of their desires or find like i think a lot of women what i'm witnessing is a lot of women don't even know what they desire because they're right. so used to like sex is a duty, providing this for my husband or at a certain s- state or a s- certain stage or role that we take on in life. So um, oftentimes it's motherhood. Then I take on this role of mother and I can't be a sexual being. I have to be right. this role. So I wanted to speak to the gender specifically, but I also think it's just certain dynamics that we play within our relationship. So how do you guys help? How do you help to break those influences of society? that kind of put pressure on men to not be vulnerable, to not, you know, sit with their feelings, to not be able to hold space. Mm -hmm. I am a student of womanist teaching. So bell hooks, Suzanne Collins, and um, the will to change was like life changing for a lot of men. And that's a modality that I approach to teach them to understand that their vulnerability is not a weakness. It is actually a boundary that they're setting for their spirit so that they are able to recognize that. Like men place value on everything outside of them. Those who are masculine in nature place a great deal of value on what is outside of them. 
what the things outside of them can do for them or what they can do for those things. And they place so little value and so little effort into the, that which is inside of them. And that's what's needed. So I do my best to make sure that they understand that, once again, you don't have to do anything to be worthy of love, to be worthy of attention, to be worthy of great sex, to be worthy of friendship. Uh, you don't have to do any of those things. And a lot of times when we have relationships that are platonic, we know that. Like, yeah, they're just there. That's, that's my friend, best friend, yada, yada, yada. We're great. But somehow, some way, that does not translate when we get into our personal relationships and our interpersonal relationships. Oh, wait, I got to do this or they're going to leave. And there's a great deal of, of wounds that come with that. And so helping men understand that the very first step in attaining that level of vulnerability is understanding that they don't need to do anything to even get it. They just need to understand that they're worthy. And that's, that's the biggest thing. You're worthy. I love that. I was just sitting here and I'm thinking there in terms of, of what I have done or experienced in the past. For women, it's that they need to see that those things are accessible for them. A lot of what I've witnessed, I have so many students and so many clients who have come and they said, I saw a TikTok video you did and I never even thought that this would be something that I could do, right? It's also deconstructing many of the ideas that we have around all of the things, religion, oh, yeah. social constructs, right? Traditional gender Oof. roles, purity culture, morality. Once we start to deconstruct that, you can see, okay, well, I know I heard that Jesus might have said X, Y, Z. And I use, the, I use this reference because I grew up in a very religious household, right? That Jesus might have these things, but all of the things Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, could be thinking about right now. He is really not worried about what's going on in your bedroom. I think there are way more things that Jesus could, if, if indeed you are concerned about that. And really starting to talk to people about, is it their belief systems or is it something else that they heard from someone else, right? Did you get this from the world or do you truly believe this? And once you determine if whether or not you truly believe it, then we could say, hey, okay, well, you don't believe that you can't participate in anal sex. And I'm using this as an example because I hear that a lot. Oh, you don't do anal sex because it's an out entry or, oh, this is only gay people. And I say this mm -hmm. in quote air quotations, right? Mm -hmm. Gay people. This is, if you do it, it's gay. If you, when you start to question, is that your belief system or something you learned? and people really start to think about it, it shifts their accessibility to those things, right? Mm -hmm. It will really get them thinking, oh, maybe this isn't what I believe. Maybe I heard someone else say this. So now that I know that this isn't my belief, let me see what I can do. Maybe mm -hmm. we can explore. Maybe we could do that. And I think that is huge. I think the last thing, and I love that you said, Kat, you mentioned the idea about women being mothers and nurturers and all of that thing. We genuinely, if we're going to get to pleasure, we have to get sad outside of this thing that I cannot be a receiver. You have to be able to take orgasmic bliss comes with you surrendering to letting it go, right? Oof. That means you have to have self set. You have to be able to say, I am capable of having selfish sexual satisfaction in this moment. I'm literally right. I got pre-orders for my book right now for, for a woman's <laughs> guy to sexual self-satisfaction because we all are always nurturers, right? We're taught, we're raised to be nurturers. If you don't believe that you are worthy of orgasmic bliss and pleasure and all the ooey gooey things, you'll never be able to sit in it. So being able to get to the point where it's like, yeah, I'm a nurturer, but I'm also going to sit back and receive this level of pleasure right now is huge, okay? So that that is my thing. We got to get past this is just I have to be a giver and never a receiver and sit in that. Yes, you should be receiving. You got an organ that's made. If you are a vulva owner, you got an organ that's made just for pleasure. Enjoy that. Mm -hmm. On repeat. <laughs> um so that that leads me to the next my next question because we discussed it briefly on our pre-interview about the orgasm gap, the pleasure gap, this experience mm -hmm. because you guys are both you're you're both kind of guiding couples together. Like let's yes. close the gap by doing it on both ends versus like pushing. Mm -hmm. And I think 
we also mentioned this, that like oftentimes women are put with the brunt of this or like they're discovering it. They're seeing it on TikTok and Instagram and being like, hey, I saw this video. I saw this person talking about this technique or this, this system that we can try or like, let's do these things. And I think you mentioned that there was like a lot of men are like, well, what's the cheat code? How do I get through and like just make it happen? And I love that both of you are like bookends, kind of bringing couples together through intimacy, mm-hmm. vulnerability, a more holistic approach to closing the gap versus like top six tips to make her come. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not, a, it, it's a band aid is what we discussed. So mm-hmm. would, I would love for you if um, one of you wouldn't mind explaining the pleasure gap for anyone that doesn't know and then kind of how you guys both work the two ends of the genders or couples and helping guide them to closing that. You want me to go, Rico? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you are the high priestess. Like you, want me to go? <laughs> you are the high priestess of under of, of the understanding of the of the pleasure gap. And uh, yeah. you the head preach on that one. Go ahead. <laughs> so the pleasure gap is effectually the differences in the level of pleasure that and I say this women and men, because those are the traditional terms, however you identify, right? The differences that women and men are experiencing, even though they may be engaging in sex in terms of pleasure. And a lot of times the way they're looking at pleasure is orgasm. They're not necessarily looking at this feels good to my body, but they're looking at the orgasmic response. And the differences are that the majority of men, I think something, I think it's like 83% the last time I looked at the stats are having orgasm in the occurrences that they're having for their sexual intimacy versus, and this is them engaging with cishet women, right? So they're engaging with women versus the women who are having sex with men. And the stats are considerably much lower, considerably. I've seen some stats that have been like 65%, some stats that have been like 43%. That is a major difference, right? When you look at those stats in comparison to to women who engage with the same sexual object choice with other women, they're having orgasms at a much higher rate than as well as that. A solo, right? Like, and, and I'm glad yes. you mentioned that, right? So, and able to give themselves orgasm mm-hmm. and pleasure at a much higher rate when they do it solo. So, being able to get to the point where we can have conversations with their partners, right? And I'm saying primarily men because that's where the the significant difference is mm-hmm. in terms of the pleasure so that they're understanding you need to be working on your portion, being a conscientious lover, paying attention to what is happening with your partner so that we can get to the point that, that, that that's bridged. And that starts with real conversations. It starts with making sure that they have all of the tools, the, the deeper tools. It's good. We, we, we want to give the, the tips and tricks. But we want to give the long-term results of what is going to help you mm-hmm. so that you have more pleasure. That's so that I could be more vulnerable and tell you this isn't working without you getting upset with me. Mm-hmm. So that I so that we can enjoy sex, so that I can be, I could trust you enough to tell you that I want to try this thing without the judgment. That's mm-hmm. where we're working on in terms of the pleasure gap. And we're doing lots of different things. I would love for Rico to hop in here too, mm-hmm. so he can tell you his side of this as well. Yeah, you know, my side of it is not too not too dissimilar, but the issue that I, I wound up seeing is that there is a huge difference between pleasure and ejaculation. So there's the there are the men who are engaging in in sex and they believe that it's all about them coming. And so when they do that, they're you have to ask them that question. Are you with your spouse because you are looking for just, you know, in-house pussy or are you just with your spouse because you don't know what, are, what what else to do because you don't understand your own vulnerability. You don't understand that there's more things that you need emotionally, which has me then, uh, want, why my job, the end of my job is such, so much more difficult is I wind up referring men out to therapy. So, so very often. And as someone who is actively in therapy, I'm realizing that when you hear someone say things like your core beliefs, you're actually having to stop and reconcile that your core beliefs have been negatively based your entire life, a great many of them. So um, when a man says, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm having sex, so I can, that's the whole purpose of having sex. I need to come. No, the purpose of having sex 
with your spouse, with your significant other, with someone you are partnered with, is to enhance pleasure and intimacy. The byproduct is you ejaculating. Mm -hmm. by, yes. That's what makes it so much more important. So it's almost like the the our our generations prior to us were telling us, oh, this is why you have sex. No, that was close. But emotionally, we want to be involved. We want to be there. We want to we want to have an energetic intertwine uh, and an energetic entanglement, if you will. Uh, that's what makes pleasure so important in our, in those relationships. That's what makes pleasure so important. Period. I mean, have period. you ever gone to your favorite dessert shop and had that one dessert you haven't had in so many whatever weeks, months, or years, and you take that first bite and it's like your synapses are all completely just set off like, oh my God, I feel that way about her fried chicken. But when you do that, <laughs> right? So when you have that and you just sit back and like, oh my God, that is so good. When that, oh my God, that is pleasure. And that's what it is that I'm trying to teach men. Pleasure isn't just what happens with your loins. Pleasure happens in everything it is that you do, mm -hmm. right? Your, your favorite baseball player knocks a home run. You feel it like right in here and it just sends you through the roof. Guess what? When you are in, energetically intertwined and entangled with someone and you have that feeling, it's the same. I, I'm trying to teach men to get their own home runs, to get their own energy, to get their own field goals, whatnot, excuse the, the sports references. But that's that's the whole point of it. Yeah. It's a, an understanding of like, what, how do we define pleasure? So how do we define intimacy? But also, how do we define pleasure? What is pleasure for you? And I love that you express that, that like, that's ejaculation. That's the end. That's an end game. Right. It's a byproduct mm -hmm. of this. But mm -hmm. it's it's the, you know, the journey destination idea. Of Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. And I love that you, I think food is one of the best metaphors for sex or the best way to kind of get people to understand is like, what do you really enjoy and what makes you go, mm, that's so good, or really have like an audible experience, a visceral experience within your body mm -hmm. when you're eating something that you really enjoy. And that's how sex should feel. I and mean, you're not just doing it right at the very last bite. Mm -hmm. Right. You're doing right. it all the, the way meal. throughout. All yes. the way right. through the meal, indeed. right? And so that's, yep. that's the differentiation. It's not like when you take the final bite and you're like, that was good. <laughs> no, no, it's, and you I'm know you all the way. Yes, yeah. and you know those meals and those those foods, those treats that do that, and so that's what you want men, women, everyone to experience when it comes to pleasure in sex. It's Absolutely. feeding your soul. It is yeah. feeding your yeah. soul. I yeah. call it a joygasm. <laughs> Because that. it it literally feels like joy all over your body when you're experiencing pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. You get to the point where it's like, this is so ooey gooey. Yeah. Let my husband touch touch my foot. This at like, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's the joy. <laughs> Let him just touch my foot and rub it. That's the joygasm. It's pleasure. And getting the point that people can center to, to can find the moments and the things that help bring them that, I think is everything. I also love that because I think, and you guys can correct me, but it's, it often sometimes when couples lose sight of that or like lose and no longer, like no longer are having sex, like let's say mm -hmm. in certain long-term relationships, it gets to a point where they've lost all of that. And even to the point where like, you know, where you're like, this person touches me and it makes me like cringe. Mm -hmm. And so how, you know, that is layered with a lot of those emotions and things that aren't being released, conversations that aren't being had, and then you're kind of being trapped in that, you know, very tight, raveled space. And then also those those beliefs that you guys are kind of talking about breaking down, those start to tighten around that more. Like we start right. to like really ground down into the things that we actually don't even know that we believe in. So how do you, I'm sure you guys have couples that you've worked with who are at that point, at the point of like, maybe this, like they're coming to see you because somebody, like we're at the last the the straw is about to break. This is like mm -hmm. we're heading in a direction that is divorce or separating or whatever it is. How do you guys work with couples who are at that point where it's like there is a distrust, there is this feeling of you know there is no joygasm when someone is touching you, there is no connection there. How do you kind of help them navigate their way back to intimacy? You really have to start with at least from the scope of my lens, from helping people so long. It really is like 
what is your point with this? Sometimes people are at the point where it's like, okay, I have endured so much. I no longer want to endure, right? I've done way too much. I don't want to do this any longer. It's time to go. For the more, for the majority of people who are like coming to us, of course, they're coming because they want solutions. Most of them are not ready to just leave, right? They're ready to talk it through. But the, the goal is, are you wanting to really stay into this and are you ready to do the work? It's going to be some uncomfortable work, right? It means you're going to get down to the root of where the mistrust is happening in this relationship. You're going to have to get down to the root of where there's so many stressors. The last thing you want to do is think about sex, right? Where you're overwhelmed so much, where you can't be in each other's spaces. Working on those areas. The areas that fracture the relationship are some of the very starting points to help people have better pleasure, right? If I can't trust you, I can't give you my body. I tell people all the time, the body does not respond the way you would expect it to respond in fight, flight, freeze, or appease mode. It is not. That does not push you toward desire. And so you got to get to the point where one, what is my body doing? Am I at the point where right now there's no way I am in safety? So I can't have desire. I can't be in tune with you. And once you identify that, okay, right now we are not on the same page. So no, I don't have sexual desire. We can work on the challenges so we can get you to the point of intimacy. We, a lot of times, one of the things that I do with our couples is I focus on helping them with getting to baseline of intimacy without sex. So let's get back to where this all started, where you actually liked each other, right? Where you didn't have 50 million things on your list of things to do because now you have to pay bills and you got to do, let's get back to that point. And then let's Mm -hmm. slowly start to integrate some intimacy, emotional, some vulnerability, some trust exercises, some accountability so that we could start to work on opening yourself up to pleasure. You got to start there. Otherwise, what you're doing is just pushing them toward the latest and greatest sex toys, and they're going to be right back in your office or someone else's. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Rico? I think um, all of those things, (laughs) honestly, all of those things. I believe that men are, um, and I say men, but really, I wouldn't say that testosterone plays a huge role because, as you said before, when Women are trying to be in a place of safety, uh, so they can't really be in a place where they can enjoy enjoy pleasure or access pleasure. I think testosterone, one of the few negative aspects that people even talk about, is that it provides an emotional barrier. So a man just wants to he wants to ejaculate. It's mm-hmm. it's a carnal, visceral experience that he just feels like he has to engage in no matter what, and then. What that does is lets him off the hook emotionally. Mm. So then when he's my age, 43, going up to 45 years old, and now he can't get an erection, he's going to Viagra because, oh, no, then there's something wrong with me. No. How about it's possible that for close to 30 years, you have been ignoring the fact that you need emotional safety, been ignoring the fact that you are an emotional creature. This is not just for women. This is not just for the softies. This is not just for the effeminate men. You are a spiritual creature to begin with, and you've ignored it for 30 years. And that spiritual chicken has come home to roost. So how about we go ahead and stop and say, let's work this out. I have helped a few men who have sat up up there and said, I couldn't get it up for, for a year or two. And then I realized I had to go to therapy and I knew what was going on. And then I talked to my wife. And then realize, and after I talked to my wife and she made it so easy, babe, I didn't know you was dealing with that. Well, let's go ahead and take care of it this way. You good now? And then he said, within five minutes, his penis got hard again. After years. Yeah. It's the acceptance. It's the vulnerability. It's the being able to emotionally say, I am not safe. I have never been safe, but I want to be safe starting now. Can we... I'm advocating for myself. That's that's the other thing. Teaching yeah. a man to advocate for himself. That's all. That's that's ultimately all I'm really trying to do. Trying to teach men to everyone to advocate for themselves. Yeah. And that's 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 where it starts. 
Let's take a quick break. Hey there, allow me to introduce you to something that has completely transformed my body, the floss. The floss isn't just a trend, it's a movement method that has reshaped the way I approach my well-being. Imagine a subscription-based platform that offers you a key to unlocking your body's potential. Fascia flossing, as it's called, doesn't just scratch the surface, it remaps the fascia network of your body. Through a tailored blend of physical manipulation, guided resistance movement, and muscle elongation techniques, it's like giving your body a personalized renovation. Since adding the floss to my daily practice in 2019, I've experienced incredible improvements across the board. My mind-body connection is stronger than ever, and let's talk about the intimate aspects. Yes, it has boosted my sexual health connection too. You can hear more about that in the episode I recorded with the founder of The Floss, Bonnie Kratzer. The Floss supports all of my body systems, enhances mobility, offers prevention, and provides that active recovery we all need. Curious to learn more? Head over to thefloss.com, and if you use the code HEADSOUTH, H-E-A-D-S-O-U-T-H, all caps, no spaces, you'll receive 50% off the first month. Let's get back to the podcast. Thank you both. Like that is incredible work that you're doing. And I think that I, I like that you brought up the erectile dysfunction and age and also because I see, I don't want to knock anything, but I constantly see these commercials for Cialis and Viagra. And mm-hmm. I know that in, in a lot of ways it has helped men, but it also, it is again, one of those band-aids and there's deeper work to be had. And I think that like mm-hmm. it actually, from what I've understood, it send blood everywhere. <laughs> and so a lot of men end up experiencing really bad headaches. It's painful. And so it, it actually then mm-hmm. deteriorates the experience of pleasure and sex because it doesn't actually feel good in the body to have that yeah. kind of blood pressure going, spreading blood all over yeah. the place. Yeah. And it's not actually at the root of exactly what you're talking about is that like the experience of vulnerability and also acceptance of aging in different stages of life and right. not just being resigned to, well, I'm, I've hit this age and this is sexuality, sensuality is no longer mm. for me right. or I can't achieve it this way or I have to do it by taking a pill or whatever it is. Um, mm. I love that the work that you're both doing is kind of encouraging people to work through the the layers and layers of stuff mm. that have been put on them, that they've been carrying around. And just by removing all of those layers, imagine we're all carrying around big backpacks full of our shit, our stuff right. compared to not. And you just start putting that down. How much more liberated you feel how much lighter you feel like when you're bringing groceries into your house and you're carrying all that shit and you're like oh my god the instant you put those bags down it's that that kind of baggage that level of baggage that that we're all carrying around and that then leads me to the question that i uh you know we started talking about in the beginning because you guys are empty nesters so there is that like coming of a certain age and then you know looking around at the space the home that you shared with somebody but you were doing the other role of parenting And so, you know, that when that shifts in time starts to open up for you, like you guys have expressed like, oh, now it's opened up a lot of more time for us to be intimate or to connect without interruption or without having to, you know, get dinner on the table, all of those things. What is your best advice for empty nesters who are looking to reconnect? And I know, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this, that like at a certain age, women are more adept to empty nesting as much as it's very emotional for them when their children go off Mm -hmm. but women because they have the social circles because they have the support systems built in with like uh their girlfriends and i think a lot of men start to over time because of what you were saying rico of like i gotta do i gotta do this i gotta provide i gotta create this there isn't a lot of social connection and so there's Mm -hmm. a lot of studies now showing that like men are dying earlier because of loneliness Right. And then also when they kind of retire, empty nest and retire, and then they're looking at their wife being like, entertain me. What I, I have, I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> so do you guys have advice for reconnecting, kind of coming into different stages of life and kind of how people can navigate that as a couple and also kind of continue their own autonomy, their individuality, because that is what then creates desire as well. Yes. Ah, man, I'm going to start by saying um, what's probably been the most important part of my transition, because I am I retired from blue collar work, was the active participation in recognizing, understanding, and identifying boundaries, right? Because men, we've done the do, do, do for decades. Go, go, go for decades. We have the goalpost. That's the line. That's the finish line. And as you said before, when a man has reached everything he needs to reach, his kids are fine. His house is 
you know, financially in a decent position, what else does he do? I've seen too many of them just literally just keel over and die because they're like, okay, well, that's all I was meant to do. And it was, it was, it was, it's, it's patriarchy. But ultimately, I realized that being able to communicate boundaries first and foremost with myself, what do I want from me? What do I expect from me? Which prior to retiring, it was I expected to be able to support my family, to support my wife, to be able to make money, to not have any any bills, and maybe have a little time to play. Now it's uh it's almost flipped and it's the opposite. I want to play all the time. Now, do I get to play all the time? No, but I understand <laughs> that when the time comes, I'm I'm very quick to tell my kids, hey, look, this is me time. And it's not a schedule of me time. It's a okay, yeah, it's two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. It's me time. Or it's eleven thirty at night. It's me time. I'm learning to be able to give myself that boundary and say, okay, I need to I need to meditate. I need to focus on me. And now once I'm able to do that, I'm looking at my wife, hey, what do you need? Before it was a what do you need? Is there something on the honey do list? Now it's a hey, what do you need? What 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 is it? Because for so long, I was so determined to get things done that I wasn't existing and I wasn't even allowing my wife to exist. So now I'm looking at this creature in front of me and I want her to exist. I don't want her to, I mean, be a bimbo, of course, you know, be, be, a <laughs> wonderful, be, my, be my sex toy, of course, please. But more importantly, if none of that even happens, I just need, and that's not even a want, I need for you to be able to just exist because I need that for myself. And so that's the new baseline, understanding that we are able and allowed to exist. We're allowed to just be for ourselves. And that makes us, helps us be for each other a whole lot better. I love that. I was sitting here thinking, and I, I, I think one of the things that has helped us and I, I, I really hope that couples don't wait on getting to know each other until they are empty nesters, right? I think one of the things that has helped us as a couple is that we have throughout, I think probably the early stages of our relationship, Dorico and I started having date night every Friday. Mm -hmm. Every single Friday, we religiously have date night. And it doesn't mean that we're going out and spending a ton of money every Friday, right? Sometimes we're just doing it at home. We're in the bed playing video games with each other <laughs> or, you know, or we're outside in the backyard doing yard work together. It's just our time together. Our kids know that we have date night has become such a thing in our lives that when my husband was working, his coworkers would be like, what are y'all doing for date night? They wanted to know what we were doing for date night. And I think that has helped us cultivate um, learning each other. In addition to us being mother and father and, you know, Yaya and all of these things, we cultivated that connection with each other. In addition to that, it is going to be huge for people to, once you become empty nesters, to start to carve out what you want your life to look like right after. I'm a mama. And like, I'm a yaya, I'm somebody's grandma, right? <laughs> At this point. But I also know that I like to travel with my husband, right? My daughter, I have four grandbabies. My baby, don't come over here expecting me to babysit on a regular basis because I might be bent over somewhere, <laughs> over somebody's balcony and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and enjoying my life. That's what I want to be able to have the freedom and to learn more about my husband, to learn more about myself. So getting to the point where you know what you want your empty nestor life to look like, start thinking about it. Are you going to travel? Are you wanting to be able to explore things that you didn't think you had the capacity to explore and get around people who are in that space in their lives now, right? I think that's huge. Get around other empty nesters and see what they're doing. Or as you're in the preparation mode, how are you going to navigate mm -hmm. this new area of life? And I'm a business owner, right? So even though we're technically empty nesters, I still run a business. So I still have to conduct things. But I love where my husband just one morning we got up and I, I love that my I told my son this, but one morning we got up and we were looking at each other and my husband says, 
uh, video games. And it was like 8.30 in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, video games. <laughs> so like having the ability to just like do that, whatever that looks like, it could be sex. It could be, let's go out and have, you know, uh, lunch, breakfast or whatever together. But knowing what that looks like to you so that you have the freedom to do whatever it is that you want to and enhance your pleasure. I think it's everything. That is what has been very beneficial for us, for sure. Well, it, it makes a huge difference. Like, I love that both of you are setting up a foundation for yourselves as individuals, yes. as well as partnership and like looking at the long game. And so yes. that you're not like it happens and then you're like, shit, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And I like that it also is, it's not just, just with sex. It's not just with intimacy. It's how do you live your lives throughout the right. different stages? And one of the things I appreciate very much about both of you in the short time that I've gotten to talk to you and spend time with you is how much you support each other in business as individuals. And so I met you guys at a, the trade show here in LA yeah. about a month and a half ago. And I've crossed paths with both of you separately, but you guys spoke so highly of your partner and supportively, and we're both vibrant in how you communicated about yourselves and introduce yourselves, but also then to speak about your partner. And I think for couples, that's a whole nother layer of working together in collaboration in business. And just without knowing the details, it just feels so incredible how you guys collaborate and support one another, how you communicate. It translates through all the different areas of your life that you share and don't share. And I appreciate that so much. Is there anything, any you know, nuggets of wisdom that you want to share in that realm, because I do think a lot of couples do embark on that of like, okay, we're doing this thing, let's kind of go into business together, let's start this company, let's do this, this project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it is like how you do, I believe how you do anything is how you do everything. So how you're communicating in bed, how you're communicating yes. when it, it comes to raising your children and creating your family and how you communicate in business, those are all different realms, but they're all the same dynamic of communication mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. Or it can yeah. be, and especially when it's all systems go and working. So I was curious of what your advice is for any couples that are kind of working through personal and professional life together. Javier Bardem, an actor married to Penelope Cruz at the time, he was in a, and I was talking to E about it a couple of days ago. There is a reporter in a junket that asked him, what's it like to be the only man that um, doesn't go crazy when it's because he's working with his wife? and you know, Bardeen basically stopped the reporter right there and said, hey, look, I just want you to understand that that is absolutely in poor taste, regardless of what the situation is. I love my wife. I love working with my wife. I support everything it is she's doing, even if I'm not in, a, in this actual business with her, you know, shame on you. And I believe when you're working with your spouse, your significant other, your partner, your lover, you have to be able to defend the value and appreciation of that relationship, even as a business relationship. So, you know, when we met, I was telling you about E, you know, and I, I told you not so much about her as my wife, but her as my business partner, because she's, yes, absolutely. she's absolutely amazing at it. She's really good at it. When I talk to people on the street about joining the Institute, I'm like, look, I'm a teacher. She's, she's completely fucking dope. Like you're going to, I would love it if you're in my class, but you're going to want to be in her class, right? Like real talk. So it's one of those things where, you know, with your homeboys, you're like, I'll talk shit to my homeboys face, but behind their back, I will tell them how great they are. But for my wife, I don't talk shit to her face because look, you, I, I make sure she's built up when I see her. And when she's away from me, Hey, yeah, this one right here, don't you fuck with her. She's very good at what she does. And so um, basically protecting your relationship in every aspect of it and nurturing it at every aspect of it. So even if and being able to feed and say, hey, look, I'm not as good as this as you are, but I need to be. So show me what needs to happen so that I'm we're filling in the gaps and understand that I'm not here as, to be as an, an assistant. I'm here to be your partner. And in, right. in being your partner, I'm just here to be like, hey, look, what do I need to do in this space so we can keep this moving? So that's that's for me, that's the biggest thing. Make sure that you defend your relationship, you support your relationship, you stand in that space of the relationship and you take up that space for wherever it is that maybe your partner is either lacking or does not, you know, 
basically I'm in the gap. Like you see how wide I am on this screen. This is the <laughs> amount of space that I take up when it comes time to talk to my wife, like here, come talk to me. So that's, that's it. That's, that's the biggest thing for me. You just turn me all on. You just, I just got all yummy <laughs> goose. Just uh, thank you, baby. <laughs> thank you. Can I, sh- I, I think the one thing I want to share is that we've done a really great job of finding the things that we're good at and paying homage to each other for those things, right? My husband knows I'm really good at certain things. I know he's, he's, listen, I can cook. My husband loves to cook. My husband is the cook in my house because he loves to cook. I can cook. I'm good at it. He loves to cook. When we're doing our working things, there are certain things that I'm really good at. He's really, he's, his degree, his background is in web design and interactive media. That's his thing, right? That's, he's going to do all of that stuff. If you're talking about making curriculum, that's me, right? I'm going to be focused on the curriculum, engaging with the students, all of those things. And so we're very cognizant of what we're really good at. And even though we're really good at those things, trying to be cognizant of, okay, how do I learn? How do I hop on and look, me looking over the shoulder to see him doing all of his web stuff and being respectful of one another's, and he said boundaries. But I I think that's been really, probably the really piece. And we like each other. Like my husband is my best friend. There is not another single solitary person in this world I want to spend every working moment of my time with. That is, I think, the difference. Like, I don't just love him. I like him and I want to be with him as much as possible. So, yeah, I think that has added to how well we've done in our spaces with our business. Yeah, it's incredible to see because you guys don't have the ego or competitive energy towards one another. And that's I think that's one of the biggest obstacles couples find and face is like the different dynamic of like combativeness to kind of get things going. And there's just this lovely collaboration adding on, let's build together and an awareness of where one might consider like, this is my weakness or this isn't where my strength lies, Mm -hmm. but also this openness to like, well, let me show you just so you're aware. Cause I think that's where people lose sight of like Mm -hmm. having an awareness of what the other person's strength is and having an ability to understand what they're doing, what they're bringing to the table versus like, let's silo and work separately and then start to resent each other. <laughs> yeah. Is a dynamic that happens oftentimes. And not just with like personal romantic relationships that are in business, but business dynamics in general that can, that starts to happen when you're not aware or, you know, you're just putting your blinders on and just doing your thing over here. And I, I just feel like you guys definitely work together seamlessly and there's just this passing and teamwork energy yeah. versus like here's my ego yeah. this is about me this is i do this this is what i'm great at it's it's really beautiful but there's also this sense of pride of what you do as an individual and what you bring to the table so you both, you both speak so well about yourselves with confidence but then also of each other and i appreciate that very much thank you yeah appreciate he's that. definitely my person <laughs> i think when we got when when e and i first got together i'm i'm big on jazz and i love music So I told her (laughs) the best metaphor of our relationship is on the piano, she's the drums or, you know, on the bass, she's the trouble so that we, we work well with each other. And it may sound like two completely different songs individually, but when you put them together, we make something really beautiful. And with jazz, you have to improvise and really listen. Boy, do we ever. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to be wrapping up. Is there anything we missed? Anything you guys want to bring up or mention? We are um, going to be accepting applications for um, our next cohort for the Pleasure Masters Institute. We are also now accepting Klarna and Afterpay. Thank goodness. (laughs) So now people can pay in installments. That's incredible. It makes it more accessible. Yes. Absolutely. We're, We're big on accessible education. And um, it's just a wonderful experience. I love having, I love being able to do it. I love teaching it just as much as I love actually being in the class itself. So I had another program that I became a sexologist with, but then I had to do her program when she told me that she was doing it. So not only did I help her build the content, but I took her class, which was why it is I can sit up there and tell everyone she's fucking amazing. 
Because <laughs> I've seen other people. But mm-hmm. um, yes, we got that going on. And uh, we will be at Exotica in a few weeks. Yeah. yeah. In Chicago. April, I think, 12th through like the 15th or something like mm-hmm. that. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. We're presenting at Exotica. Cool. Which you guys, your presentations, I only got to see a glimpse of it at the trade show here in L.A. It's amazing. It's so much fun <laughs> to see you guys on stage and the work that you do. Can you just tell everyone where to find you? Like your website. I know, E. Michelle, I think you have a really great TikTok, I believe. My yes, yes. Second time like, around, right? Yes. This is my second TikTok page after the first one got took down. But you can find me on TikTok at The Pleasure Masters. I, you can also find me on like Instagram at sexologist E. Michelle and um, at Pleasure Masters Institute on Instagram. I spend the majority of my time on social media, though, on my TikTok page. That's mm-hmm. where I'm probably cultivating the most. You'll see the most content there. Uh, you can also find us on our website at sexologistemichelle.com or pleasuremastersinstitute.com if you're interested in becoming a sex coach or a sexuality professional. It's my institute. I'm biased, but it, it's pretty dope. Amazing. Um, I wanted to thank you both so much. This is such a pleasure. It was an amazing, yeah. very quick hour. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Bye. And I appreciate <laughs> both of you taking the time to share your wisdom, share your stories, and to express vulnerably about your own relationship and your path here. No thank problem. you so much. We truly enjoyed it. So thank you for allowing us on. And Hopefully your listeners will connect with us so we can help them amplify some pleasure in their lives. Thank you both. Thank Thank you you. so much. Special thanks to all of our guests. Head South is hosted by Kat Meyer, produced by Isis Barlow, edited by Megan Hook, with music by Lily Rezzy Rothman, graphics by Ella Chodos Irvine, cover art by Gina Ship Casey, and intro by Murph Meyer. If you're looking for me, I'm heading south. All year round, I'm going down. Now you know where I'll be, I'm heading south. So come on, look me right in the mouth.